Welcome to the latest episode of the Informing Choices mini-pod. Deloitte's Tony Reeves characterised the intelligent age as the age of with, where every human works with intelligent machines in every activity. It merges the digital, physical and human worlds, collaborating across the boundaries of each to improve performance and empower smarter humans to achieve more at incredible speed. For us today, the questions are around the characterization of intelligent age, what it might look like in 2050, and the significant technologies of the time, and how this comes together to impact the kind of work we might do in the second half of this century. To help me consider these questions, I'm delighted to welcome Chief Executive and a futurist at London-based Global Futures and Foresight, David Smith, back to the podcast. David, a warm welcome. Many thanks, Steve. Good to be with you. So, so let's start with that first question, shall we? Um, how else might we characterise the intelligent age? What is it that we think we mean by that? I think well, I've um, I've been talking about this for a little while, and uh, that definition is terrific. Um, I think really it's just to put it in context. We had sort of the information age, then we've had the digital age. So the information age is all about things that produce information. That we did something with it, and in hindsight, it was quite crude, but it was quite explosive at the time. Digital era was the devolvement of technology to devices that used uh, use that data anywhere, anytime, in any fashion. So digital was an explosive area, and it, it described processes as much as it described technology mm. in terms of the digital era. And now what's really quite exciting, we're, we're animating digital assets. So if you haven't got as far as creating a digital environment, a digital company, a digital software, digital processes, digital technology, then you're going to have an awful hard job animating what you haven't got. So right. it's a huge leap. So the automation of everything, and that's a very crude, easy uh, to, to understand term, is what the information age has led to in digital, then ultimately the, the intelligent era. And we're increasingly over the next period, because we do this in stages, we always have. You know, I've been in technology since 1974. So I've seen every wave of technology. I've worked in it on the supply side, the user side, and I've seen how it takes us by surprise every time and how it alters how we run things and do things and work with things. And this is the most exciting time I've ever seen in my life where the intelligence of the machine is replacing now, if you like, the the, the professional thinking processes as well as what we've done in the past. And, you know, really, we've replaced man, manager, you know, clerical with data processing manual with diggers and tractors and smart devices on fields and ultimately managerial decision making in the last phase and now it's the professionals turn yeah. to be have parts of their world automated which is really quite painful so it's in its first instance it's very traumatic for many organizations to to see this and just as an aside you know i'm not surprised in the same way the luddites push back at technology which made their skills redundant we've got people now saying this is the end of humankind because we're on the path to ai yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the the scaremongers um it, it, one of the things that strikes me that, that you were, when you were talking about kind of the evolution and 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 how these technologies have kind of moved into the uh, professional the services sphere if you like is the sudden power um and development of generative ai it feels like it's really been a game changer, doesn't it? I think generative AI is. Any any technology that gets our imagination. You remember when the laptop came out, you know, people sat at their desks with laptops and their jobs were nine to five in an office with a laptop. And he said, have you not noticed it's movable? You can actually take this device somewhere else yes. and you're self-contained. And it took ages for people to have atriums to start with. And finally, because of COVID, in truth, we're, we're, people were forced from home. And HR looked at it and, and the the, the folk managerial functions in business finally worked out you can have a hybrid working environment. Mm. But look at the, the the effort it took to shift from one, one operation with technology to another operation, even though the technology had dramatically changed. Well, I mean, here we are with generative AI. I mean, it was launched 30th of November last year. Every smart kid was doing their homework with it. I'm still quite surprised and a little bit suspicious about my son who got a first at university uh, at the end of last year, how early he got on to generative AI. I'd like to think he used it for research. I'm sure that's what he did. But um, 
you know, the 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 it is a complete game changer because it appears to be so intelligent. Yeah. I mean, basically, if you remember the early definition of computers, they're fast thinking idiots. Yes. Well, generative AI is a sort of even a faster thinking idiot. Yeah. It's based on what it finds and then says with an authoritative tone, this is the answer. And quite often it's right, but actually many times it's completely wrong. <laughs> so it stands on the shoulders of data it's collected yeah. and doesn't actually apply very much intelligence. It's a stunningly clever technology and it's impacting everything that we do in terms of operations, services based, you know, thinking uh, workers, knowledge workers. But it's it's not that type of AI that can take the world over. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things you spoke about there was the the kind of the uh, transformational impact of of COVID. Um, so, what are the other kind of forces do you think that are coming along at the same time as these technological forces to actually change our approach to the way that we do business, where we do business, and so forth? You know, what what are these other change forces do you think? Well, I'll pick a couple of them. You know, when I was born, there were 2 billion people on the planet. When I went to work, there were 3 billion people. Today, there are 8 billion people. We're going to top out at 11. So even if you do nothing else but think, where are these people? Where are they growing up? How educated are they? How are, how are they entering the workforce? And you suddenly see the world's move from uh, Europe-centric to US-centric to Asia-centric. Yeah. So we, we've shifted the way the world works in terms of economies and and, and markets. And, you know, things like large grills on the front of cars, it's not a European convention, it's a Asian Chinese convention. So we're now seeing that we're, if you like, a secondary market to prime markets, which are elsewhere. And I've been forecasting that for years. Yeah. But, you know, in your squeezy bottle, you'll see a sticker in English covering up all the natural languages. So it, it, China is now on a purchasing power parity basis bigger than the US. And India's only a, a close third. So we've changed dramatically the way the world works and where the influence. And we, you know, I always said that America would react and find it quite hard to come to terms with the fact that they're not the big stick in the world. And that's beginning to happen. So the world works differently. The world will work increasingly different. Plus, at the same time, just for the fun of it, the population is aging. Yes. So in the UK, we're 40. We're getting ready for a midlife crisis. And the average age in India is 25. They're just going to work. So if you think about the 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 energy level inside economies, uh, Europe's a bit older even. So you've got uh, um, Italy's just retired, basically. So you, you've got economies that are fundamentally changing. And therefore, we want older people to stay in the workforce longer while we still need human beings, which you won't always for the work we used to do. But we are going to th think differently about how we engage 60 and 70 and 80 year olds in the workplace. Yeah. I love I love that phrase, the energy level in the economy. That's a really, really nice way of thinking about the, you know, the, the relative average age in uh, uh, in different areas of the world. Um, uh, look, you, you, you really nicely kind of characterize, if you like, the evolution through to the intelligent age. Um, can we be a bit speculative for for a minute or two? You know, what might come after the intelligent age? So if we're if we're having this conversation in, in 2050, what kind of age might we be imagining we'd be working and living within then? Well, it's always hard to speculate, but it's only 25 years away, but it's still mm. relatively hard because the speed of these changes and the bar and the, the, the gateways are quite hard to see until you're in them. Then, then it's clear what's beginning to happen. But I would say is the health age. You know, at the same time, we're in the intelligent era. We're also in the quantified era. So we're, in parallel, everything that's measurable will be measured. And that's everything from disease in the atmosphere to microbes to everything else. You know, every part of our function of our body will be measured in this era. But what I think in, in 25 years time, the issue will be health, health and wellness. We will be able to interdict, interrupt and, and fix at a very early stage many, many uh, chronic diseases we now live with and one of the reasons I think we'll die is through accidents and disease. You know, we, we won't we, we won't um, die from aging. You know, we probably in 25 years will have remedies for two or three of the causes of aging. So that is being treated as a chronic disease, which is fixable. So will in 25 years we've got there? Possibly. So longevity, wellness, well-being, health. You know, maybe we're going back to biblical times where we lived to 500 or 700. 
But he always said that's not possible. But if you ask the gerontologist today, they're already forecasting it. They're not saying this is something that might be interesting. The at the bleeding edge of thinking about it, you know, people like Aubrey de Grey and others are genuinely talking about two and three and four and five hundred year lifespans being quite regular and normal by people who are already born today. Wow. That's extraordinary. And, and, and one of the other things I always think is, is, is extraordinary is, you know, you think 2050, which sounds like years into the future. And then when you start to you know, count back, actually, well, it's only about 25 years. I, I always then say, well, actually, that's only five parliaments. Yeah. You know, and what are the kind of societal and political and policy implications of that kind of radically different future? And and you know, just to kind of go off on a bit of a tangent for a second, you know, where's the where's the thinking um, that could potentially drive policy across the midterm that actually supports that kind of very different future? It, it it's fascinating, isn't it, when you start to think about it in those terms? It's really not that far away. No, it's right. It's right on us. You know, we we will be doing things today that directly impact us in 2025, going through to 2050. I mean, literally, those are the decisions. But we've not been traditionally very good at anything longer term than two years. Yeah. So half a parliament, you know, they're getting yes. ready to be re-elected or not halfway through a parliament. So we've got a version of democracy that basically doesn't work. Mm. So most of Western democracy doesn't work. So if you think about Greek democracy, you know, it's not what we have today. We have a different version where everybody's opinion is equal, everybody's vote is equal, um, and we don't get anywhere. We don't do anything. We build, we build half a train line. Yeah. You know, I, I remember when that was first announced at the IOD, I was giving a speech, and I said, well, it's 35 billion now, and it started off, which never was 60, by the way, it was 35, and it'll be 100 billion before you know it. And blow me, we get to 100 billion, and we cut it in thirds. So, and it's not even, you may not even make it to London. You think, oh, for goodness sake, <laughs> that we, we are staggeringly bad at thinking anything, how we ever built the Channel Tunnel is beyond me. I mean, it was started in Napoleonic times. So we did take a, quite a long run up of it <laughs> That's to, to, to actually finish the thing. So we need to think differently about what landscape we want and so not throw a couple of hundred million at AI and say, we're going to be a world leader. That probably isn't going to work. So you've got to be strategic and we haven't got strategic government, but I would say, is that we're now at an era in our lives, on the world, where more people live in, in um, undemocratic economies than democratic. So there's all forms of non-democratic, but it's not the most popular form of government these days. So, you know, maybe benef beneficial dictatorship is the answer. By the way, I'm not voting for that. But, you <laughs> know, I think our form of government will change. It'll either be massive numbers of plebiscites, because we've given up on trying to run anything effectively to ask the people and that won't necessarily work out well or or, or we'll have some form of um longer term um uh, operation because you can't you can't do things short term and get away with it even though everything we're doing is turning very quickly yeah. we have to think differently about our education system's been bust for i don't know the last 30 40 50 years all the way through data processing all the way through it all the way through our social change we're still telling asking people to do a, an O-level or GCSE in geography and one in history. And it's, it's the integration of that that's actually how we spend our lives. There's a few academics that do their own thing, but most of us mix these things together. So our education system isn't terribly good, um, kind, uh, and what we'll do for work is, is different as well. Um, I just want to go back and, and ask you a question where, when you were talking there about uh, about democracy and uh, uh, and perhaps dictatorships. But I do wonder if from a strategic perspective, being able to take a long term view, uh, make the appropriate investments. Is there a benefit in autocracy compared to democracy? Well, there is. I mean, you just have to have, have somebody who quite likes people and doesn't isn't despotic. You know, we try and avoid being yes. North Korean. Um, you know, the Chinese ones work because they set out a plan 32 years ago to marketize elements of their economy. Yeah. And, and literally, apart from the massive oppression that they brought in the process to keep order, they've marketized sections of their economy. And because of the scale of, of, and the, the low cost of most of their labor, they managed to do it. Well, now they've, they've, they've got the same issues that many Western economies have got. Yes. Um, and they they could easily implode. But the point is, the the ability to deliver an, a single route to success. I mean, think about it, China, you know, they're, they're now the, the what are they, 12% or sorry, 18% of the world's economy. 
There'll be twenty four percent in um, literally seven years, um, almost double the US, and it's exactly the same position we were in eighteen twenty. So in the world in eighteen twenty, China was the first economy, India was the second, believe it or not, and the UK was the fourth. And the we're now going back to a point where China is going to be the first. The US has has, has nipped in there. It was number ten in eighteen twenty. It's number two now. And the China and the India is the third. So we, we've gone back in two long cycles in Chinese terms, i.e., two hundred years. We've gone back to the way it was. That's that's absolutely fascinating. I love that. I love that. Um, let's let's talk a little bit then about uh, this the kind of the intelligent age, the intelligent age in twenty fifty, and some of the enabling technologies. I guess some of them will be kind of familiar, but you know what are we talking about? What is the intelligent age going to be built on? What will be you? What will we be using in twenty fifty? Yeah, I think we'll have um, virtual and pervasive IT, so it'll be all around us. So it'll be massively distributed IT. The idea of a central device and maybe even a smartphone may even be redundant, believe it or not. So we could find devices themselves that we own um, just not required because we're so surrounded by everything with a with knowledge, with a connectivity in it. So a massively connected society, the ability to interpret anything we want, probably by thinking as well as um, speaking. So uh, in an, an environment that's measured massively, so it'll interdict risk and and uh, potential danger to us uh, in every way um, possible. So we will have different technology in 25 years than we've got today in the same way that we had it 25 years ago. It was massively different to today, but the speed of it is actually faster. So it's almost impossible to understand what we'd have. But we'll have scrollable screens that you can unfold from your pocket. We'll have devices that are are massively different to, to we have today, or we share devices anywhere, anytime. We'll probably have the power of quantum will be well understood by then. So we'll be mm. up to a thousand or a million times faster, depending on what we're doing. So with data, we go from um, you know one zettabyte in twenty fifteen to seventy in twenty twenty five to two hundred by twenty thirty to I reckon about five hundred yottabytes. So it's 500,000 zettabytes by 2050. So data, um, people call it the oil of the new economy, where it's well beyond that, you know, and most of it's rubbish. So the intelligent systems will sort out the chaff and the wheat for us, um, will determine our preferences and what we want by literally understanding our lives. So we don't have to express that manually anymore. Security will be through the quantum internet and probably quantum blockchain. So it's using the qualities of quantum computing across the network. So the baddies will probably get there quite early. But nonetheless, you know, we will be able to secure because nothing's secure against quantum today. But and the baddies will get quantum early because they'll be breaking everything out of the sun. But quantum blockchain puts it back in place again. Yeah. So the speed of information, the speed of interpretation of information, simultaneous translation is not an issue anymore. Language. Um, into into you know, engaging with the with the the environment will be whatever my preferences are and whatever i feel my preferences are so you know w- walking down a road if you still choose to walk you know you what you want and what you're doing there you'll be informed about where you can get what you want yeah so people will book you tables in a restaurant if it's available they'll offer you a discount on your coffee they'll book your car in if you really got a private car anymore which by the way you won't so yeah. you know everything our world will be massively convenient massively personalized to the world we want it to be and that's also across much of africa yeah i guess that's one of the big changes that we're likely to see is the kind of technology driven wealth we've enjoyed in what we call the developed west at the moment will begin to move into other areas of the world and, and and you've spoken a lot there about the kind of um, information technologies, but but what about things like materials production, production processes themselves? Because you know you could argue that some of the technologies starting to emerge through three D printing, four D printing technologies yeah. could make things so cheap that actually everything is abundant, everything is plentiful, and costs so little. You know, is is that a realistic or plausible view of the future? Do you think? And what might the implications be? 
additive manufacturing, 3D manufacturing, 4D manufacturing is absolutely a way ahead. It's been a slow burn. But if you go to any any industrial um, conference now, mm. if you go to the exhibition area, they all show 3D printers. They all show 4D printers. There's nobody else doing anything else. I mean, the biggest thing is a 6,700 square feet um, building in Dubai. Uh, and it was built with four men and one machine. So effectively, all the concrete, which is, by the way, the crush strength is even more than traditional concrete walls. So these things aren't worse replacements of, of existing technology. They're quicker and better than existing technology. Therefore, they'll take off. So we'll have devices made that are tiny that will go inside our blood system. So we'll have robotic devices that have been created that, that, for example, replacing red blood cells. So you can swim for two hours underwater or you know, hold your breath for three hours. So the... The, the thoughts of things we can create using additive manufacturing, and they themselves will make the machines that are small enough to do the things we need. Uh, and you get some nano devices made by machines because humans can't get down there or create devices that do that. So we absolutely, we will have massively personalized. But what I love about the whole 4D, 4D, 4D and 3D world is that you are very often using reusable materials. Yeah. So when you finish with your building, for example, you crush it up and paste it and make a new one. So we don't need tents for the people who are homeless in the desert anymore. We'll build them houses. It's just as cheap. And we'll recrush it afterwards and reuse it somewhere else. So and the plastics that are used and a lot of other things. In fact, there was a study a while ago that said that parents would allow a 3D printed heart to be put in a five year old if it was a good if it was, if it was the right thing for them. So the degree of trust in these things when explained is so high that we will increasingly want massively personalized things in our lives uh, and then reuse them. The circular economy will be well and truly in existence. We don't want wardrobes full of things. Basically, we haven't got a wardrobe anymore because there isn't space. Yeah. There's so many of us on the planet. So we don't hoard things. We don't keep things. We use things. So it's become a user circular economy, 3D fabricated, highly personalized world. I love that view of trust as well. Once once we kind of trust something, then all of a sudden it becomes mainstream, normal. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when you didn't have calculators at school. And you know, at one point we began to trust them. And I guess, you know, technology is a bit like that, isn't it? At every opportunity we get to really use and uh, um, become very familiar with a piece of technology. It's the trust, really, that's the trigger point for it uh, being con consistent within all of our lives. But we also don't know how to deal with it. Remember as well, Steve, that we were banned from taking our calculators into our exam rooms. Yes. Because somehow that was heathen and not, not playing the game straight. So in the same way that teachers are now coming around to the view that people should be perfectly able to use ChatGBT, but actually do that with the knowledge that it may or may not be right. And they have to do the work to determine what is and then use it as a research tool, not as an, a finished product tool. Yep. So it, all, all these things change what we did before, but we often find it impossible to perceive that yeah. up front. Yeah, yeah, very true, very true. Um, so given everything we've been we've been speaking about here, um, what what are the what are the impact that we might see on the kind of work that we might do? What sort of jobs might we be uh, doing in in twenty fifty? Those of us that have jobs. Yeah, I mean the trick is look. The, if you can create the same amount of wealth in a country by machines doing more of the work, then the issue is actually how do you share it? Yeah. So it's it's a whole new language we need to have about tax and welfare, which are terrible terms and cause people to um, have issues with them. So is philanthropy part of corporate success these days? Is actually helping people to, with financial, is um, universal income a way forward, sharing uh, income without it becoming a communist state so we we've got some big challenges if, if we generate the same wealth if we just let the the big five just get bigger the big it corporations i mean that they, they are i did some, i did some last year and the the gdp if you like of the top five it firms um is bigger than the bottom 110 countries in the world <laughs> so you know we can't just leave things like that forever without it being redistributed in fact many people in those the heads of those organizations are philanthropic they give it away to whatever their causes are but we need a different way of redistributing wealth so number one is 
will be working probably to some degree because we get a lot of pride and and sense of worth by being paid income so we when that is filtered out of us by all means things may be very different but they're you know, just giving someone money maybe we just sit on the sofa and watch the telly that's that's not necessarily the answer we need to be motivated feel we're making a difference contributing in some fashion it's funny enough actually i've been saying for years we're going to you know care the care services is a booming area and we and we need to revalue for society what we think is there's, there's um i think it's eight is it eight million short in the next 20 years or was it no 82 million 82 million short of care workers in the next uh, uh, seven years wow. so do we let the filipinos carry on doing that because it's cheap work or do we say that's a that's um an area of work where we're, just, we're bringing dignity to people and it's good work. So we've got to rethink where we see value. You know, we give it to the um, the bankers and the insurance um, organizations who make money from just thinking um, and we pay them large salaries and that's lovely. There's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, that's, machines can probably do it better than them very shortly anyway. So what are we going to be doing? I think we're going to be doing brand new types of work. Very often, as you quite rightly said, Steve, at the beginning of this, is interacting with technology. Yeah. You know, what one of the one of the greatest things we'll do in the future is be able to work alongside and with various forms of AI and robotics to do the whatever we're trying to achieve. Um, and that's great. So brand new ways. You know, I think IBM called it the the um, teachers, um teachers, um informers, performers and, and teachers, something like that. Yeah. Three types of uh, roles you have with machines. That employs quite a lot of people just to tell people what these things do and how they work and where they're going. But, you know, avatar managers, you know, we're going to increasingly work in virtual worlds and virtuality blows hot and cold every five minutes. <laughs> and, you know, every, every time, ever since Second Life, you know, flooded the world for a, for a gimmick. So it, it hasn't taken off. A meta jumped too early to change their name into the metaverse and try to own that. But it will, it will develop. You know the the, the product the um the, the uh, content is poor, which is apart from gaming, it's poor generally. Once the content starts to become more realistic, which God willing with the technology improving, it will become more realistic. We'll want to engage with it more because it's more beneficial. So narrow casters, virtual teachers, um, virtual um, uh, mentors, anything around virtuality is it's going to be a whole new world to do wherever you want. Things like waste data handlers. You think about the amount of data we're going to have managing data. Basically, you know, I think one of the biggest liabilities companies have is data on their books. So if you've got data, didn't use it, but if you did use it, somebody wouldn't have suffered loss. Are you liable? So in the future, we're going to dug, we're going to talk to companies and say, well, you you may not be able to access it in the way you wanted, and it may not have been usable, but you did own it. This data, you should have known, therefore, that that person shouldn't have been sold that product or should have been put in that position and therefore you're culpable so you've got to pay it all back so we we will visit tomorrow on, on today's organizations if you like tomorrow's values right. and therefore we're going to companies are going to struggle they need to really manage data stunningly well and, and prune out what they don't need and keep what they do and, and use it legally and, and you know collaboratively with the data providers yeah. so lots of new jobs around that social networkers because the social network is breaking people by what it does to people. We need social networkers to do the opposite. So it's yep. like social workers across networks. So there's lots of jobs that we don't need that don't exist yet. And, and I haven't even started, and I won't, by the way, for your sake of your podcast, is the jobs in health. You know, you think about the new technologies in health with nano devices running around our bodies, finding cancerous and precancerous individual cells, flushing themselves out, repairing from the inside. I mean, we're going to look back at this era in a very short time and so we're like the victorians cutting legs off sailors in battles and sticking their legs in tar as, as and the speed of the surgeon was the thing that you either lived or died by in yeah. the future cutting someone open is going to be complete last last case last cause you, you just don't do it anymore you do everything inside out so massively different health and wellness and personal medicines and that's 3d by the way you know, 3d printed personalized combined medicines is definitely something the pharma industry are already doing actually They've yeah. done it in the States in 2015. The FDA approved the first 3D printed drugs. But there's now a, a massive move in the UK and in Asia and well, worldwide. Uh, David, um, that's been absolutely extraordinary. I mean, we, we, we've covered um, 
the uh, the idea of politics changing. We've, we've spoken about autocracy and democracy and um, how politics can or finds it really difficult to be uh, long term thinkers and, and, and very strategic. We've spoken really well, I think, about the uh, the health and wellness uh, of uh, of the future. Uh, we touched on education, how that needs to uh, to shift. Um, we've looked at a, a more socially responsible uh, economic outlook um uh, i guess something that some people might couch as a star trek rather than a star wars economy in the future and basically we've underpinned that um by a journey through a number of really interesting technologies and how they um, are likely to affect the work that we that we do in the future uh, david that's been absolutely brilliant thank you so much for your time you're very welcome nice to talk to you steve and thank you, everyone, for listening and watching. There'll be another episode of the Informing Choices mini pod very soon, and I look forward to seeing you then.